Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's wonderful to have you at Brookings this afternoon on this wonderful spring day. Um, my name is John Allen, and I'm the president of Brookings, and I have the honor this afternoon of, of introducing this event where we welcome the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Singapore, uh, Minister Heng Sui Kiet, uh, who is joining us uh, on his trip to Washington, D.C. to speak with the World Bank and other entities, and we're very honored that you can join us today, Minister. Thank you, sir. He's been Singapore's Minister of Finance uh, since 2015. In his capacity, he manages Singapore's national budget, oversees uh, corporate governance regulations, and supervises the use and investment of public funds and government reserves. Minister Heng additionally chairs the Future Econo Economy Council and the National Research Foundation in Singapore, where he oversees skills development and industry transformation and the country's research, innovation, and strategies for enterprise. Mr. Heng has also served as the Minister of Education from 2011 to 2015, where he directed Singapore's efforts towards a holistic, student-centric education system. But prior to entering, entering politics, Minister Heng uh, served as the Managing Director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore from 2005 to 2011, and he also served in various other public service positions throughout his career, including as the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the CEO of, trade, of the Trade Development Board. And very importantly and significantly, he was the Principal Private Secretary to then Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Mr. Heng, we are really honored that you could be with us today and looking forward to hearing your prepared remarks. Uh, after the Minister's remarks uh, and, speaking, uh, and speaking of uh, Prime Minister uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Minister Heng will be joined by Brookings Senior Fellow and our Lee Kuan Yew Chair in Southeast Asian Studies, Jonathan Stromseth, uh, for a moderated conversation. Jonathan has been serving in the chair since 2017 and has done a tremendous job uh, and tremendous work supporting our Center for East Asia Policy Studies via expansive research and convenings on Southeast Asia to include the creation of a new online forum entitled Southeast Asia Insights. Throughout their conversation, they'll cover a wide variety of topics related to U.S. engagement in the region, and once he and the minister have concluded, we'll happily turn to you, the audience, for some questions and answers. For my part, I've got a bit of experience in East Asia and in Southeast Asia. I was honored to be a part of the process for the negotiation of the first U.S.-Singapore Strategic Framework Agreement. And I believe the entire region is fast becoming one of the most important and influential regions in the world. And I, that's obvious, I think, to anyone who's observing the world these days. And there could be no better time for our deepening of our understanding of Southeast Asia in particular and Singapore's role in that world and our world more broadly than in this conversation and on these days. So it's exceptionally important, especially in the context of the global megatrends unfolding before our very eyes, like mass urbanization, the historic shift of economic power from west to east, uh, changes in demography, and very importantly, climate change. It's another reason why the minister's presence here today is so important for us. And a final housekeeping comment, it, everything is on the record, <clears throat> though we're not live casting the event today. So with that, Minister Hung, we are honored for your joining us today, sir. Please uh, join us on the stage for your remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, John, for your kind words and a warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here today and to uh, meet so many of you this afternoon. Now, um, you know, when I was a young civil servant, I spent a, a year at the Kennedy School of Government, and uh, it was an extremely valuable time for me to learn more about the U.S. and also about public policy and governance. And it was a, it was a very interesting experience because, you know, I spent my undergraduate in Britain, and the British students as undergraduates were a lot more reserved. But at the Kennedy School, they were all postgraduate students, and uh, the Americans were extremely uh, warm and welcoming, uh, including my professor who invited us, the whole class, for 
a Thanksgiving dinner at his home. It was the first time I had a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, and uh, it was such a wonderful uh, trip. And even till today, the professor keeps in touch with me. He just sends me an email uh, some weeks back saying that you know, he reread a paper that my wife and I wrote you know, more than 20 years ago and asked me for an update. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, it's really a, a great warmth. And I spent a month when I was uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's principal private secretary touring the U.S., meeting with uh, President Bush and uh, touring the Bush Library as well as a meeting with uh, Dr. Kissinger and uh, Secretary Schultz at that time, as well as many uh, business leaders. And it was an extremely valuable trip for me to learn more about the U.S. and, uh, and its leadership role in the world. So uh, today, I'd like to share my thoughts on three, uh, in three areas. First, how the U.S. has enabled Asia's peace, prosperity, and stability since the end of the Second World War, and second, how the U.S. economic engagement of Asia will underpin its strategic engagement of the region moving forward. And third, the importance of international cooperation and the rules-based international order amidst geopolitical and economic uncertainty. Now, American leadership has been instrumental for the global peace and prosperity that we have enjoyed since the end of the Second World War. The U.S. was a key driving force behind post-World War II reconstruction. The U.S. sent aid to Western Europe through the Marshall Plan. And within Asia, it helped to rebuild Japan, the Republic of Korea, and the Philippines. The U.S. was also the visionary and architect of this age of globalization and economic integration and spurred the founding of global institutions such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. Within Asia, U.S. security umbrella has been the bedrock of peace, stability, and prosperity. During the Cold War, the U.S. role in the Vietnam War prevented the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. I remember as a, uh, as a young boy then, how all of us were so fearful of the communist domino coming down from Vietnam onto Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and the rest of us. And for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, you know, he fought the Malayan Communist Party uh, during the years of Singapore's independence. It was a very frightening uh, prospect. But the U.S. contribution in the Vietnam War, although it was very uh, uh, painful for the U.S., was instrumental for the region's uh, peace and then eventually the growth. So the peace and stability uh, fostered, provided a conducive environment for the region's growth and prosperity. In fact, uh, by opening up its market to the region and fueling trade and investment, the U.S. played an even more active role in propelling Asia's economic development. So today, the U.S. is a key economic and security partner for many Asian countries, including Singapore. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence mentioned that the U.S. businesses have invested more than 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars across the Indo-Pacific and devoted more than half a billion U.S. dollars to security assistance in the region last year. The robust and multifaceted partnership between Singapore and the U.S. has also deepened. The U.S.-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, the first free trade agreement signed between the U.S. and an Asian country, has been a cornerstone in our bilateral economic relationship since it entered into force in 2004. It continues to bring substantial benefits to both U.S. and Singapore businesses. The U.S. is the largest foreign investor in Singapore, while Singapore is the second largest Asian investor in the U.S. Singapore is also the U.S. largest trading partner in Southeast Asia for goods and services. On the security front, Singapore is a major security cooperation partner of the U.S., and John would know this very well. In 1990, our country signed, concluded a memorandum of understanding that facilitated the transit of U.S. ships and planes through Singapore. This was at a time when the U.S. left Clark Air Base and Subic Bay Naval Base. Today, the U.S. is the heaviest foreign user of Singapore's air and naval bases. In turn, more than 1,000 Singapore military personnel are hosted each year for training in the U.S. Our armed forces trained alongside each other 
and have participated together in international operations in Afghanistan and the Middle East. In fact, Singapore was the first Southeast Asian country to participate in and the only Asian country to have contributed military assets and personnel to the defeat IS, IS uh, coalition. The U.S. impact in Asia goes beyond economics and security. Many in the region admire the U.S. openness, dynamism, and ethos. And thousands of students from Asia study in the U.S. every year, and I mentioned my own experience studying in the U.S. In fact, the first student from China to have graduated from a North American university, Yongwing, graduated in 1854 from Yale University. And in Singapore, we have also set up the Yale NUS, uh, Yale National University of Singapore College, drawing on the intellectual tradition of Yale to offer a broad-based liberal arts program for our students. Now, Singapore's experience bears testi testament to the positive impact that US engagement has had on the region. Now, looking ahead, we are facing increasing geopolitical and economic uncertainty. So I'll highlight three trends just in the economic arena. First, the trend of increasing globalization and economic integration no longer appears straightforward. There are growing concerns that the benefits of globalization have not been equally distributed. A recent report on the Brookings Financial Times Tiger or Tracking Indexes for Global Economic Recovery Index has also cited geopolitical uncertainties and trade tensions as factors that could hurt future growth prospects. A second trend is the rapid emergence and convergence of new technologies, or what some have dubbed the fourth industrial revolution, in changing the way we live, work and play. And third, there has been a shift in global economy weight towards Asia. Emerging Asia has a combined real GDP of 14 trillion US dollars, making it one of the world's largest economic regions today. China's share of global GDP, based on purchasing power parity, has risen to over 18% in 2018, and China is now a major trade partner for most Asian countries, including Singapore. Now, the 10 economies of Southeast Asia, 10 economies of the ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is also one of the fastest growing regions in the world. I just attended the ASEAN finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in Thailand two weeks ago. And we discussed areas to strengthen ASEAN integration, including in infrastructure and green sustainable financing, digitalization and cyber resilience. Indeed, ASEAN has come a long way. ASEAN's GDP has also grown over a hundredfold since its inception in 1967, from 23 billion to almost 2.8 trillion US dollars in 2017. ASEAN is the US fourth largest trading partner and is projected to be the fourth largest economy by 2030. While Asia's growth in a short space of time has not been without trade-offs, there are widely held views that Asia will continue to grow over the next decade. Now, how do these economic forces shape the geopolitics of the region, and what do all this mean for U.S. role in the region? I believe the U.S. presence in Asia will continue to remain vital to the region's peace and prosperity. In particular, sustained long-term economic engagement will anchor the U.S. presence in and complement its security ties to the region. This will also enable Asian countries to better engage the U.S. Asia's rise will lead to new needs such as in infrastructure, demand for quality food and health care, and tourism. Take infrastructure, for example. The Asian Development Bank has estimated that Asia will need to spend 1.7 trillion US dollars annually until 2030 on infrastructure to maintain its growth momentum. And this needs present opportunities for American companies to grow new markets and make new investments. 
U.S. businesses and capabilities can meet strong Asian demand in areas that the U.S. lead, such as infrastructure and energy and Industry 4.0 clusters. For example, the U.S. is a leader in the development and application of AI-driven technologies and is home to the most number of AI companies in the world, over 2,000. Another example is the digital economy. There are good opportunities for U.S. companies, particularly in ASEAN. ASEAN is the world's fastest-growing internet region, and it is projected to have a $240 billion U.S. dollars internet economy by 2025. Many U.S. businesses have a long-standing presence in the region and have significant interest in growing their Asian mar Asia markets. Their business operations in Asia make a sizable contribution back to the U.S. economy, not only in terms of business opportunities, but also in the creation of good jobs for Americans back home. Today, U.S. exports to ASEAN are growing faster than total U.S. exports. And ASEAN is also taking a rising share of U.S. overseas investments. So, for example, between 2011 and 2018, U.S. exports to ASEAN grew over 16%, compared to around 12% for total exports. Now, Singapore is positioning ourselves as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. And we hope we can serve as a springboard for U.S. companies seeking to invest in the region. Indeed, deepening economic ties between the U.S. and Asia is a key thrust of the administration's free and open, free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which promotes mutually beneficial collaboration in the digital economy, infrastructure, and energy. And we've seen some encouraging moves by the U.S. For instance, the Build or Better Utilization of Investments Leading to Development Act has increased the total amount of money available for development finance to 60 billion US dollars. It can complement other initiatives, such as China's Belt and Road Initiative, in promoting collaboration and connectivity in the region. <coughs> Last month, the US, Singapore and the US signed a Memorandum of Understanding to promote infrastructure developments and investments in Asia through closer collaboration between Singapore's Infrastructure Asia office and the U.S. Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Beyond Asia, uh, what will be the U.S. role in a global arena be? The world we live in is increasingly interconnected <coughs> with global markets, 24-hour news cycle, and soon 5G. This has resulted in interdependencies of an unprecedented degree. Similarly, the challenges we face, such as terrorism and climate change, are increasingly transboundary in nature and of a global scale. This necessitates more international cooperation and not less. The, US, the UN's Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG, recognizes this. The SDGs reflect our collective aspirations and our call for global action. While there's no single model of development, global partnership will be required to solve complex challenges and ensure global peace and prosperity, now and in the future. New technologies will also present opportunities for, for countries to come together to find solutions, create new value, and improve our quality of life. For example, in areas such as sustainable clean energy, water and food security, and cities of a digital age. The US and China, are, as two major powers, play an indispensable role in ensuring peace and security and in any global efforts to address common issues and challenges. Recent trade tensions between the US and China are worrying. The US-China relationship is a key determinant of global peace and prosperity and the most important bilateral relationship in the world. As China continues to grow, some competition between the US and China is inevitable as each nation strives to safeguard her interests and to create a better life for her people. 
Competition can be constructive if managed well. Competition spurs innovation and drives us to learn from one another and to be better and stronger. But competition can be destructive if it, if it degenerates into conflict and rivalry and we lose our focus on common interests. While there are differences and com competition between the US and China, there are also interdependences and opportunities for mutual benefit. It is not a zero-sum game. It is vital that disputes between both countries should be resolved in accordance with international norms and through existing multilateral frameworks. No country wants to choose sides. Ultimately, there are opportunities for the US and China to come together and play key leadership roles in resolving global problems and challenges. Take climate change, for example. The rise in sea level poses an immediate threat to Singapore, which is a low-lying island. Much of Singapore lies only 49 feet above the mean sea level, with about 30% of the island being less than 16 feet above the mean sea level. So imagine what happens when the sea level rises. Many other countries, including the US and China, are facing similar threats from climate change. Now this brings me to my final point amidst the resurgence in nationalist and protectionist sentiments around the world. We must renew our commitments to a rules-based multilateral international order. Rules and norms ensure predictability in interstate relations and commerce, while multilateral processes ensure that they, are built, that they are built through consensus and widely respected. The rules-based multilateral order has brought peace and prosperity and ensured that the world we live in is not one where might is right. It has served the global community, including the US, well. Global rules will need to be updated as the global environment changes. Take the World Trade Organization, for example. Its formation after the Uruguay Round recognised that the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, was no longer as relevant to the realities of world trade as it had been in the 1940s. While progress on the Doha Round of Talks has been slow, countries, including Singapore, have continued to pursue partnerships and bilateral or regional deals, such as the US-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, as pathfinders to greater economic cooperation. This building block approach allows us to build up confidence in and enable adjustments to the global trading system. As the global economy and international order change, all countries have the responsibility to work together to reinvigorate our rules-based international order and ensure its continued relevance. This needs to be done consensually and multilaterally. Ultimately, we should not retreat from the rules-based multilateral international order and globalization. The US will stand to benefit from continuing to play a leadership role in rule settings and dealing with challenges in our interconnected world to enable prosperity for all countries. Finally, given that Jonathan, the Lee Kuan Yew Chair in Southeast Asian Studies, is moderating our conversation later, I'd like to end off with a reference to Mr. Lee. This is the only academic chair in the world named after Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee believed in the resilience of the US and its capacity for renewal and revival. This is due to the can-do spirit and innovative culture that is part of the American DNA. When Mr. Lee addressed the joint meeting of the US Congress in 1985, he said, and I quote, America is a great nation moved by high ideals. Only the elevating power of her idealism can explain the benign manner in which America has exercised its enormous power since the end of World War II and the magnanimity and generosity with which it has shared its wealth to rebuild a more prosperous world. I believe that this message rings as true today as it did then. First, the US presence in Asia 
will remain critical for the region's peace and prosperity. A second, the US economic engagement of Asia will increasingly underpin its strategic engagements of the region. And third, the need for international cooperation and US leadership in maintaining our rules-based multilateral international order is as vital as ever. Thank you, and I look forward to exchanging views with you. Mr. Heng, uh, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, thoughtful and comprehensive remarks. Um, and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you now. Yeah. Um, I think it's obvious uh, already, but uh, we do have something in common. Um, as you said, uh, I'm the Lee Kuan Yew Chair in Southeast Asian Studies here, which is a great honor. Mm -hmm. um, and earlier in your career, you were the principal private secretary for Lee Kuan Yew. All right. So I thought maybe we could. Uh, given this connection, look back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had a chance to read some of his past speeches and interviews. Um, and of course, he touched on many of the things uh, in his day that you touched on right. now. Uh, one point he made, uh, I think, about 20 years ago, was uh, he asked the question, would a rising China be as benign to, to Asia as the US had, had been in the past? Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, Singapore is not sure. Other Southeast Asian countries aren't sure. Um, but he, he felt that a stabilizing factor mm -hmm. would be a healthy US-China relationship. Mm -hmm. In particular, one that has a combination, uh, a good balance of cooperation on the one hand and healthy competition on the other. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're seeing today is really only competition. Uh, and it's not necessarily healthy. And cooperation, perhaps, has become a relic of the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific policy of the Trump administration talks about uh, predatory economics of China. Uh, it talks about uh, regional hegemony uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, and China is uh, exercising a very muscular neighborhood diplomacy, mm -hmm. which many Americans feel ha has the aim of excluding the United States. Mm -hmm. I think um, having known Li Kuan Yew, I wonder if you could uh, give us a sense of if he saw the region today, um, what would be his reaction and concern? Would he have any advice uh, that we could take away? Wow. <laughs> you, you started off with well, one of the most difficult questions. You know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I had a, a most wonderful time working for, work, uh, for Mr. Lee and uh, learned a great deal. And uh, uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I read his memoirs before it got published because he, I was serving under him when he wrote his memoirs. Mm. And uh, I recently reread some, some parts of it and some of his uh, speeches on, on this area. And I would say that uh, his, uh, uh, his assessment of how the US-China relations would evolve as China's economic weight in the world rises uh, remains as uh, valid today as as, as before. And it is not an easy adjustment for anyone. But I would say that I, I share Mr. Lee's view that the US-China relations will be, as I said in my speech, the most important bilateral relations in the world. And how do we uh, make the adjustments along the way to make sure that this most important bilateral relationship is a constructive one, is a key challenge of our time. And I will start with ensuring that uh, both sides have a better understanding of one another. Uh, the, you know, the, the two nations uh, have very different DNAs and uh, the very different systems. And both are extremely complex uh, places. And it's, uh, whether it's in the economic realm, in the political realm, or in the social realm, uh, they are extremely complex. And for us, uh, even uh, in, in Singapore, in Asia, we spend a lot of time trying to understand China. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though you know, 
many of us speak uh, Mandarin and so on. And so the important question is, how do we ensure that that relationship is constructive and how do we build bridges for a deeper understanding? Now, I mentioned, let me just share one story about you know, how complex it is. Uh, when I was working for Mr. Lee, we were working on the Suzhou Industrial Park project. And the Suzhou Industrial Park project was agreed between Mr. Lee and the central government for us to share the software of development. So we developed uh, the Suzhou Industrial Park uh, as, a, as a platform for us to share experiences on development and what we need to do in terms of rules, uh, proper rules for investment. Thank you. Proper rules for investments and uh, how we need to train people, need proper master planning. But um, a few months into the project, after all the details were signed and sealed, the, the, uh, the local officials started to promote a rival park. And they said, well, you know, uh, the Suzhou Park is no good. You have 65% share, we only have 35%. And uh, we'll rather have one that we will promote ours, which is 100% owned by our, uh, our own local government. And so this official then went around going to global investors and said, you know, forget about that park. Yeah, come to mind. And um, all this uh, information got to Mr. Lee and he was most uh, enraged. So he decided to take it up with President Chiang and uh, Premier Tzu and I was involved in many of their discussions. And at the end of it, um, the, uh, uh, the officials who were working on this, our, our side, heard many stories from the Chinese who said, uh, you know, you Singaporeans operate in a one system of government, one layer of government, so you don't understand the complexity of China. And China has so many layers of government. So the, the official term that was used in those days was that um, the, in Chinese is Shan Kao Huang Ti Yuan. You know, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. So don't assume that edicts by the emperor would be implemented on, on the ground. And... Uh, the other common phrase which was used was that they said, um, yu tui che, xia yu zhen che. the top will have a strategy, the bottom will have a counter strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, Mr. Lee felt very strongly that the problem had to be resolved because otherwise the project will fail. And in fact, Singapore was not in the project to make money. Singapore was in the project to uh, transfer you know, what we have learned about economic development and how we must, if we want to attract international investors, you must have proper rules of law and that whatever we sign and agree on must be carried out. So after lots of difficulties, we managed to get it resolved. Now, you're looking at a situation where Mr. Lee had been to China many times. He understood many aspects of how the, the Chinese system worked and yet we encountered such a problem when we do a project like this. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it across many different areas, there will be plenty of uh, areas for dispute, for disagreements. But I think if we focus on what is our common interest, and that is the most key part of the relationship, mm -hmm. then I think many of these issues can be resolved. And we must uh, put a greater effort on promoting deeper understanding across. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you know, uh, many of the American institutions yeah, including Brookings, can play a very important role in bringing people together to really understand the bigger picture that both countries, mm. both big nations, great nations face uh, and the whole world faces in, in this. Thank you very much uh, for your own thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, as I look at the relationship, um, I think you, you really nailed it uh, on the head in your, your remarks that uh, there are so many issues out there that can't be resolved mm. unless uh, the U.S. and China uh, somehow begin to communicate and, and engage right. again somewhat more effectively. And uh, first among them is climate change, mm. uh, and, and you identified that in your remarks as mm. well, uh, which is something uh, that I'm, I'm deeply concerned about as the father of two daughters and uh, as we all look to the future uh, and so on. Um, and uh, I think before the Paris uh, agreements, um, the United States and China um, uh, brought a lot of energy uh, to that issue, mm. including that energy to Southeast Asia and to ASEAN. Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe now is the time for Singapore and ASEAN uh, to help bring that back to the United States-China relationship in, in some way and, and serve as the bridge that you mentioned. Yes. Um, 
I also wanted to say how appropriate I think it is that, it is, um, that a minister of finance such as yourself uh, is speaking today about U.S. engagement with Asia because I think that geopolitics in Asia today is very much an economic game. Mm. Um, you mentioned, and I think correctly, um, U.S. Uh, business engagement in the region remains robust in terms of FDI and trade, although a lot of it is actually concentrated in Singapore. Uh, some of that spreads out to the rest of the region. But I think uh, China's presence is more diffuse, mm -hmm. uh, more tangible, I think, to most Southeast Asians. And uh, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is the, the platform uh, that everybody is talking about. Uh, there has been some unease and pushback of late, uh, and yet also some renegotiation. Uh, I think the rail link in Malaysia is actually going to go forward now, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, and so that perhaps uh, looks uh, fairly sustainable. And I think the, the question, you, you mentioned some of the MOUs, for instance, the U.S. MOU with Infrastructure Asia and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Um, the U.S. also, at the end of last year, signed an infrastructure-related MOU uh, with Japan, which has uh, robust infrastructure funding in the region, and Australia. And, um, you know, sometimes these multilateral platforms um, can kind of wither on the vine and languish over time. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, is there energy behind them? Is there resources behind them? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if you have some optimism uh, that these platforms uh, can actually get off the ground and help to draw the U.S. more into the region mm -hmm. uh, on the infrastructure side, which I think also has strategic implications as well. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, am, uh, I am optimistic about this infrastructure development because I think if you look at the region's development, we need both good hard infrastructure as well as soft infrastructure. So if you look at hard infrastructure, for example, building... You know, whether it is power plants, sewers, buildings, uh, or connectivity across the countries in port, air, air links, seaport, airports, roads, all these are going to be very key to the development of the region. But the question for infrastructure is that, by its own, the nature of infrastructure is that these are all very chunky projects. You know, the capital cost in the initial stage is huge, and unless we plan it properly, it will not yield a proper return. I think we've got to make sure that all these projects yield a proper either economic or social return, or both. And the question is how to do it well. Mm -hmm. So we have given quite a bit of uh, thought on this, and uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Indrani Raja, uh, spoke to me. She used to be a lawyer drafting many of these agreements and said, gee, this is getting complex, and, uh, we do, but we do need good legal agreements. So she suggested that we should try and standardize as much of these contracts as possible so that you have standardized terms, contractual terms, and then if there are minor variations that are needed to suit the particular situation, we could do that. And then, we, then she, I said, well, go ahead and work on it. And then she went on to talk to uh, auditors, to talk to engineers, and so on, and realized that actually beyond the economic, beyond the con legal contracts, you need, first and foremost, proper planning of the, uh, uh, of the project to make sure that it is well structured. You really don't want to build roads nowhere. Uh, we have uh, seen how countries were trying to stimulate the economy and started building infrastructure and building roads to nowhere. I was sharing this story with somebody and they said, yeah, I just encountered a case where somebody asked me to build an airport, uh, but the airport has no connecting roads at all. <laughs> so uh, how do we, how we do infrastructure in in a proper way, with proper planning, and, and against the whole range of priorities that a country would have mm. is key. And uh, so that's the first thing. And two, having done that, no multilateral development bank or uh, private institutions or government will have all the resources to build the infrastructure. Because by its very nature, it is so lumpy uh, and that the benefits are spread out over many, many years. The only sensible thing to do is to take out some kind of a commercial loan, properly structured, that would allow the different phases of the project to be financed. So we worked with a number of uh, institutions to do that. Uh, one, we worked with the banks, some of which are doing project financing and they want to do uh, the high risk, high return part. And others like pension funds and insurance company want the longer dated assets, which are of lower risk, but stable returns. Mm. And uh, so that's one phase of the work. 
and the other is to make sure that uh, we are able to structure the contracts uh, properly. So by bringing the demand and supply side together, we hope that it can catalyse uh, investments into that project. And at the same time, we hope to also bring both the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure together. So an, an, an example is our work together with Vietnam on the Vietnam-Singapore Industrial Park. So besides just building an industrial park where there are factory facilities and so on, we actually work with them on technical and vocational training of workers. So workers have a good uh, a job at the end of the training and companies that come in are assured that you have the skilled manpower to, to do the work. So it, it is win-win both ways. Mm. So we believe that infrastructure projects are important. They are important for development, whether it's to supply sufficient energy, water or uh, uh, facilities for economic development or to build connectivity by roads, by air, by sea. But at the same time, we need to structure it well, we need to be thoughtful about it, and we need to bring in uh, the multilateral banks, we need to bring in the private capital. Mm. So in fact, I spent uh, some meetings with the World Bank here in Washington during the IMF World Bank meeting to discuss with them what we can do. The World Bank has an urban, infra uh, urban development and infrastructure hub in Singapore. And the World Bank has an excellent repository of global knowledge of developments, which I hope that they will continue to bring to our region and to provide proper training so that uh, those of us who are involved in infrastructure development can understand the policy uh, parameters for doing this work. Mm -hmm. And uh, step by step, we can build the knowledge and ensure that projects are done with sufficient discipline and with uh, proper consideration of its uh, long-term returns, mm -hmm. as well as properly integrated. Yeah. yeah. So um, I wanted to uh, raise another topic that, uh, frankly, has been much in the news lately. Uh -huh. um, and it's a draft legislation in Singapore's parliament. Uh -huh. um, if I understand, it's called the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Mani Manipulation Bill, or right. in the vernacular, it might be called the uh, Fake News Law or right. something like this. And as I understand it, the official purpose of this legislation is to ensure that online falsehoods don't drown out authentic speech uh, and ideas uh, or undermine democratic uh, processes mm -hmm. in society or the public interest. Right. Um, but critics, including journalists and uh, academics, uh, are concerned that um, the law might grant uh, authorities too much leeway mm -hmm. to determine what is true and, and what is false, um, and that there may be kind of worrying implications uh, in a world where virtually everything we read and write, including as scholars and mm -hmm. academics, is now online. Mm -hmm. And given the concerns um, that are being voiced, I was wondering if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about how this law will be implemented if it's passed by, by the parliament, right. um, uh, as, as is, I think, widely expected. Right. Well, that's a very important issue. And in fact, I, was, uh, I had a nice breakfast with an American friend. And he said, you know, as an American, I was brought up with this very simple principle that everyone is entitled to your viewpoint, but everyone must get the facts right. You know? So viewpoints have to, be, have, have to be made on proper facts. And the law is essentially about getting the facts right. So for instance, if we say that uh, you know, person A has killed person B, it is a statement of fact. And if there's no truth to it, uh, the person ought to make the correction, right? Otherwise, we'll all be making the wrong assumption. And while we say A has killed B, sounds innocuous. If you turn it and say it, Christians have killed Muslims or Muslims have killed Christians or you know, white, a white man has killed a, a black man and vice versa, you can imagine how in a multiracial, multireligious society, uh, and in fact, anywhere in the world, this can lead to uh, great uh, conflicts. But... If you say that, if you hold an opinion that, look, you know, the policy, your policy options are horrible and that I have a better policy option or that your policy is not achieving results, mine will offer a better result. Now, that viewpoint, that proposal, people are entitled to, to bring it up. In fact, this is what democratic institutions ought to do. So what we are hoping to do is to make sure that we bring debates we want to have good 
discussions. And good discussions and good conclusions must be made on the basis of the right facts. And you cannot have people, now with the internet, anyone can post anything. And the key is that, am I prepared to stand by what I post as a fact? I think anyone can express whatever opinion, but is it a fact or is it not a fact? And the law goes into correcting, uh, ensuring that organisations and individuals take responsibility for correcting those facts. Either you correct them or you remove them. You know. So those, I think, are in fact principles to strengthen democratic institutions, not weaken it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, we're uh, well into the Q&A time right now. Uh, so oh. let me uh, start uh, Stanley Roth. <laughs> And if I could ask everybody to uh, please state their name, as I just did for Stanley, uh, and also your affiliation. Stanley Roth, retired, no affiliation. Good I to see, see you again. Good to see you again. Mr. Minister, I have only one comment before my question. My comment is, I miss the wisdom and advice of Lee Kuan Yew, uh, and I greatly, greatly appreciated your wisdom and advice today. Uh, my question concerns the BRI, and I'm not fishing for criticism of China, but rather I'm asking how do you assess the balance between two possibilities? Well, it's obvious that there's a huge need for infrastructure resources, mm -hmm. not only in Southeast Asia, but in other regions of the world, South Asia, Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, what China has done, is doing, and will be doing dwarfs what the United States has been doing. On the other hand, there is concern about a debt trap uh -huh. that, you know, as a, these resources are provided, then maybe it's not doing it at a, on terms or at a pace which the countries can't afford. I would like to ask you, at least for your region, for Southeast Asia, ASEAN, mm -hmm. how do you see BRI, BRI balancing out between these two poles? Yeah. Well, um, I, I think early on we, we talk about how, you know, the Malaysian government is renegotiating some of this because... Uh, they wanted to make sure that it was, it, it is a project that is economically viable. So I would say that in Southeast Asia, people uh, are quite conscious, you know, after going through the turmoils of the Asian financial crisis uh, in particular, that when we do long-term investments, it needs to have uh, either a return, whether economic return or social return. And this concept is quite well uh, understood by, by everyone. Now, the question is, uh, how do we uh, ensure that that is so? And that is why I think working with uh, all parties involved is very key to it. Because it is, it is easy. I mean, as, as finance minister, I receive lots of proposals from my other cabinet colleagues. I want to do this, I want to do that. And, and we go through every proposal with a very sharp pencil and say, look, do you really need to do this? What are the returns? And so on and so forth. And there is a very well-established methodology for doing this, uh, for assessing the value, as assessing the cost-benefit. And uh, I spent some time uh, earlier this week talking to our World Bank colleagues on some of this, because the World Bank has been doing a lot of good work on assessing projects of this nature. And what, is, what I think is very important is for, for all of us to build up our knowledge of how do we do projects uh, well, you know, structure it well so that it is economically or socially viable and whether that investment is something which uh, countries can uh, afford uh, the, and what are the priorities. So I think, I believe that properly structured, it can be positive and I hope that many countries will uh, join us in this effort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maria? <coughs> Um, good afternoon, Minister Heng. It's a pleasure to have you here at Brookings. Thank My name you. is Mireya Solis. I'm Director of the Center for East Asia uh -huh. Policy Studies. And my question has to do with uh, responses to the current crisis in the international trading system. Uh -huh. As you mentioned, Asia's rise has been predicated on open multilateral trading system and in the nurturing of economic interdependence, especially mm. through global supply chains. Mm. You made reference to the fact that geopolitical uh, tension and economic uncertainty uh, makes us doubt the continuation of those strong engines and foundations of growth for the region and more globally. Mm. So my question to you, Minister Heng, is what kind of regional responses are there? Are they uh, uh, viable or not? 
Because if one were to be very optimistic, one can see Asian countries really reinvesting in a rules-based liberalization process. Two examples, the survival of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement against mm. all odds, mm -hmm. and then the ongoing negotiations of a regional economic uh, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, or RCEP, that will include China, ASEAN, and other countries. Mm -hmm. So you could say that uh, Asia is still a strong believer on trade liberalization. Now, if I take a less optimistic view, I could say, unfortunately, the TPP has moved on, and the United States is not latched into the regional architecture. On RCEP, we don't know yet if the negotiations will successfully conclude we will be ambitious enough to tackle the important areas of digital economy, services? Will it introduce any discipline on the uh, practices of China that have generated some concern for introducing distortion? Mm -hmm. So are you an optimist or a pessimist when it comes to regional solutions to the current oh. crisis? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm neither an optimist or a pessimist. I hope I'm a realist, uh, hoping to achieve a better outcome. And, uh, you know, we, I, I think first on, on what the region can do, I would say that uh, I was in the trenches negotiating many of the ASEAN uh, economy uh, cooperation agreement. And uh, at the time when we did it, it was an extremely hard job in the trenches negotiating every dot, every comma and full stop. But uh, I was very glad that even at that time, my colleagues in the other Southeast Asian nations were very seized with it. And uh, in fact, among ourselves, we said, we don't know whether our trade ministers will agree to this, but never mind, we'll just put it in and you know, persuade them as, as much as we can. So the result is that you have an ASEAN economic community. Now, some people doubt it and say, well, look, this is only on paper, you know, you'll be torn apart and, and ASEAN moves at a snail's pace. My uh, former foreign minister, and was then the trade minister, George Yeo, uh, had this very wise saying to us all the time, that if you look at it from year to year, it, it moves incrementally. But if you look at it over a span of a decade, you will see a big step forward. And indeed, that's, my view is that it has been a big step forward uh, over these years. The question is, what more can it do? In fact, uh, the recent agreements have been strengthened and that uh, there is a, a greater, there's even agreement on services. And we just concluded at the ASEAN Finance Minister's meeting a package on financial services. So within ASEAN, it is uh, the commitment to free trade and regional integration remains very strong. What we uh, need to do, and what we need to do is to use that to extend it beyond ASEAN. And you mentioned about the CPTPP. I think it's a pity that the US uh, did not sign, did, you know, which was a very key proponent of CPTPP, uh, did not eventually uh, became a member of it. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, you know, changes are, are, are possible in the, in the future. On the regional uh, arrangements, um, besides the RCEP, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations have also been had very good agreements with Japan, with Australia, New Zealand, with India, and with uh, uh, the other, uh, and China. And we are, we've got to continue to work on that so that you have some common denominators for which hopefully more and more people can sign on. Yeah. One reason why Singapore has pursued bilateral agreements is that, and, and regional agreement, is that we really believe that Bilateral agreements can be building blocks for a global agreement. In fact, uh, when I was permanent secretary in the Ministry of Trade Industry, when all this was being done, uh, I, I wrote, I had to write a few op-ed pieces to explain because some of our colleagues were very unhappy that you know Singapore broke ranks and we started negotiating free trade agreements with New Zealand and then later on with US. Um, our explanation is that. Trade deals are inherently difficult because if you want to do a global deal, I was at Doha, and you find that the number of issues that you need every country to agree to is so enormous, it's very hard to get an agreement all at one go. And we need to build confidence. We need to build confidence by showing that a bilateral deal, a regional deal, enables us to make progress 
And by making progress and getting our companies to adjust to all these changes, our industry and our workers to adjust to these changes, uh, it will be, uh, it is manageable and in fact it brings benefit. And we also need to be better able to articulate those benefits. Yeah. But it is hard because the pro problem with trade is that the benefits are very diffused and spread very widely, but the costs are very concentrated in certain segments of the industry. So yes, last evening when I was walking back to my hotel, I decided to go into your CVS pharmacy to have a look at the range of things that are up there. <laughs> and I realized what a whole range of uh, countries were uh, you know, producing those products. And I must say that the prices were very competitive. But as a consumer, would I attribute it to globalization and free trade? I don't think I'll be thinking of that. But if I'm a worker and I lost my job, I say, what the heck? You know? hmm. And that, I think all of us will need to, to deal with that. And in particular, all of us will need to spend a lot more time and resources to train our workers. So I think we have time for one more question yeah. uh, right there. Yeah, yeah. Lynn? Yeah. This last question, everybody. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you, Minister Heng. Yeah, thank you. Um, you spoke earlier about what you thought was uh, necessary so that uh, China's Belt and Road uh, Initiative, Belt and Road Initiative, would be economically viable. But you also mentioned in your penultimate point that you know economic engagement will um, increasing uh, strategic engagement increasingly means economic engagement for the region. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you could sp uh, address specifically what you see as some of the possible strategic implications for the region of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, do you think it's changing the strategic landscape of the region? Thank you. Well, I, I think even without the Belt and Road, uh, the economic engagement of China the region is, is changing the landscape. Because as I mentioned in my speech, uh, China is the number one trading partner of almost every country in, in the region. So that economic weight uh, is by itself of some strategic weight. Yeah. And uh, in the case of Belt and Road, the, what it means is that the engagements will be even deeper. So for the region's development, it is not a bad thing if it's sustainable, if it, it is viable. But the question is that you know, we, we think that uh, uh, multilateral engagements, because ASEAN members will be happy to engage with uh, you know, all our major partners to do more. Mm. Because I think the one constant in, all, uh, in, in every country is about a better life for our people. So economic growth is key to that. And how do we promote uh, freer trade and at the same time ensure that companies and workers remain uh, competitive, they can play their role in the world. It's a very important part of it. But if we can do that, uh, then we would have the, the means to be able to fulfill this. Otherwise, politics everywhere will get more toxic. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that will be, uh, that will lead to a more dangerous world. So that, I think, the changing economic weight will change the strategic weight. There's no doubt about that. But the question is, how do we continue to maintain a balance by having multiple players in this, and by focusing on many common issues that the entire world faces, like what I mentioned, you know, in fact, we just were talking earlier to President about some of the grand, some of the major trends that all of us have to deal with, from climate change to uh, the growing urbanization and the digitalization. And the question is, can we bring everyone together to address these challenges for the benefit of all of us? Or do we spend our time fragmenting into different bits and pieces and uh, engaging in destructive uh, conflicts? Yeah. Well, I think that's just right. And I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, <laughs> under the, uh, the research of the Lee Kuan Yew chair here, looking at uh, enhancing US engagement, especially on infrastructure in Southeast Asia, is, right. is one of our areas of focus. Uh, maybe as an opportunity to uh, have more multilateral engagement and then re-engage oh, China from a position of strength. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But uh, on behalf of uh, John Allen uh, and the Brookings Institution, let me uh, ask everybody to uh, thank uh, Minister Heng for thank coming. You. Thank you. 
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.